Well, it looks like we could probably get started with whoever's here. So a uh, little bit of introduction. Um, we really threw this together last minute. We saw an open time slot and uh, there were supposed to be two presentations, I think, for Fedora Server originally on the agenda. Uh, Peter Boy, who is the leader of our working group, um, unfortunately had a bicycle accident and uh, was not able to join us. Yeah, bicycle accident with a car. Um, so uh, he is. He did say uh, recently, yesterday, that he uh, put in the channel that he is recovering well, so we're thankful for that. Um, but uh, you have two members of the Fedora Server Working Group here, and we thought we'd just gather together those who are using Fedora Server, uh, maybe especially in a home lab type situation, uh, talk about how you're using Fedora Server, um, what, what things do you love, what things would you like the working group to maybe focus on or um, put as goals to improve uh, Fedora Server in the uh, releases to come. So just have a, an open bridge of a feather discussion. So uh, I've had Barry, use the uh, mic oh, yeah. here. Uh, sorry. Where's the button? No, he said it was no. off. Is it down there? Here, why don't you use this mic while I'm yeah. figuring out that mic. Okay, so um, I've had a, a number of this, uh, discussions today about the uh, Fedora server, and one of them was with Adam Williamson. Uh, he, a, a recurring, con uh, a, a recurring uh, subject of the discussion in the Fedora server working group is uh, how can we make uh, Fedora QA test the, the roles that we, we use Fedora server in. Uh, using Fedora Server as a PostgreSQL database, as a MariaDB DB database, a web server, uh, a netboot. <coughs> and uh, the solution that we've come up with is uh, using Ansible playbooks to uh, configure uh, Fedora Server so that it does what, what we want it to do, and then use AutoQA to test that uh, this works as intended. And the end goal is to be able to uh, ship uh, Ansible playbooks that on release day uh, you can just uh, maybe configure to your liking, uh, adding in your host names, your IP addresses, and uh, play them, and you will get a working PostgreSQL database, MariaDB database, uh, netbook server, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this only works if uh, w w we, we now have uh, hundreds of uh, playbooks. Well, we're on the verge of getting hundreds of uh, playbooks, but there's no way that Fedora QA is going to test hundreds of Ansible playbooks to, to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. So we're really looking into the used, what, the f what users of Fedora server uh, use it for, so that we can target those playbooks in particular. Over to you. I have this mic working, so if anybody wants to talk, we be, bring the mic to you. All right. I'll be the first. Um, so my usage of Fedora Server is a bit different than traditional Fedora Server. Um, so currently, right now, I am using actually the Asahi Linux project and basically their server image. I don't know if you guys are in any way uh, responsible or, you know, talk between those two groups or not. There's a person called Neil Gumpa. Yeah. Who is a member of both groups. Okay. Yeah. So he's the bridge then. Yeah. He's in everything. <laughs> Yeah, so I use that for a home server use case um, per, uh, right now um, for like running, you know, like a Plex server, multimedia server, um, you know, basic home home lab type of things, you know, at, at a very small scale. I've really tried to scale back the amount of, you know, VMs and other things that I'm running just because of the the expense of hardware as well as other things. And I work at Red Hat, so 
I kind of get the option to be able to utilize our lab equipment and that sort of thing to be able to build things. So, but I mean, I think something that I've been thinking about a lot is with the advent of Bootsy and um, bootable containers and kind of the way that um, at least Red Hat is looking at things and trying to push things, you know, what particular use cases are, you know, are you guys thinking about as far as in the server working group of like, you know, for Bootsy based um, images, you know, like, are we going to continue to configure things, you know, the same way or like, what are your guys' thoughts, I guess, generally on, on the Bootsy uh, container stuff? So uh, I can speak for for Steve, but I uh, just discovered the concept um, uh, on the first day here when I saw the YouTube video that the Fedora project had uh, posted. So it, it, it looks interesting. I haven't had time to sit down and reflect on how useful it could be, what we could use it for. Uh, for the record, I, uh, I use Fedora server, well, I use Fedora as an NFS server uh, uh, at my home because I have a, a small PC running on my TV and uh, it allows it to stream my videos, my music, everything in, in the living room so that I can listen to it there. So one of the very, very first roles that we're targeting is NFS uh, server and NFS client. Yep. <coughs> We, we have a, a number of people who are interested in home automation and how they could use Fedora in, in that sense. Yeah, I just learned about Boot C today in that presentation <laughs> by Dan. Okay. So. <laughs> So uh, more use cases, I actually have a need to, well, I have a, a, a machine that I've just bought, which is, uh, has a two, two LAN uh, uh, ports. And the goal is to take my ISP's setup box, uh, put it in one, port, in one port, and have the other one lead to an internal network, which is completely separate from my ISP's uh, set-top box, which would require uh, DHCP, T TFTPD, uh, so that I, I can do installations and install virtual ma machines uh, automatically, or somewhat automatically. I also have a, a mail server, which, um, so, uh, you're, okay, uh, I, I have my, my own web domain, and I, I handle my own main mail, which is a pain in, in the backside. Please <laughs> don't do this. Th this made sense 10 years ago. It, doesn't, it no longer does today. Every, every time I have heard someone say, I have a mail server, their next words out of their mouth is, don't do this. God, don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it, it made sense a while ago. It yeah. no longer does. Yeah. Uh, but I'm... I, but I also handle mail servers at, uh, at work, and that is a separate uh, thing. So I'm still uh, looking forward to writing playbooks for Postfix, Spam Assassin, Clam AV, uh, and uh, I might as well make those run on Fedora server as well as uh, RHEL, which is what I use at work.
No, this is the the spot uh, smart router thing. Yeah. Oh, a, a big part of our manifesto is making sure that people can use cockpit as a, a web UI uh, to configure their server. No. From no. <laughs> uh, my understanding is well. Number one, you have PF Sense. You have um, you have a company behind that. Uh, and they're giving the software away, away for free because they make all their money off of the hardware that they sell. Not even all, the, all of the features are free now. Yeah, like yeah. Now they've they've done some changes. I run a PF Sense router in my in my home lab, and I love it. But to try to duplicate something like that, um, we would first have to have some sort of software package that we could pull into Fedora that would actually give you that web GUI front end. Um, and would help you make all those changes in your firewall rules easily. Uh, right now, the, the mechanisms that we have to, to change your firewall rules and everything that's necessary for your, to turn it into a router is not easily done. And we don't have an easy interface for that. So that would really be nice because then wherever you install Fedora server, you could obviously turn it into a, a router. That'd be a fantastic thing, but I don't think there's any open source packages that we could pull in that would get us to that functionality. I think there's a bunch of little ones. I mean, there's a bunch, you know, Google Switch, all this stuff, all exists, right? It's just like yeah. gluing it all together. Gluing it all together, have right. You, have you heard of OpenSense? So that's a project yeah, that's the, the yeah. work of it. Now, but see, OpenSense is just a fork of PFSense, uh, well, going back. Um, and so it's also based on FreeBSD. So oh, both, both, PF, yeah. both PFSense and OpenSense are based off of BSD. Um, so you have that, that difficulty of crossing that bridge as well. Going back to the Ansible roles, uh, we have a package called uh, Linux server roles. System, system rules, yeah, I think that's what it was. which I am the co-maintainer of the, uh, sin, since uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am. Uh, so a while back, I, I looked at Galaxy and uh, was trying to find um, uh, Ansible roles that do what they are supposed to do on Fedora. And that is much more difficult than uh, it seems. I, I think I started off with, with uh, Jeff Gerling's uh, roles before realizing that he targets uh, RHEL and Ubuntu and uh, really doesn't support anything else. And he doesn't even target RHEL anymore. And he stopped targeting RHEL for reasons that we, we don't really... Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, then I found uh, another... Uh, person on Galaxy who is called Robert de Buck, who has, uh, also has hundreds of roles, but su who supports Fedora on those for which it, it makes sense to support Fedora. So he has an e EPL uh, role, and he doesn't support that on Fedora because it makes no sense. But for those uh, for which it makes sense, he supports Fedora. And I wrote him an email a while back uh, asking, can I package these as an RPM and package them in Fedora, and he replied, go ahead. So now in my fedorapeople.org namespace, there's a .src.rpm, and I have uh, built it on my machine and installed it on my machine, and I am now replacing all the contents of my playbooks with uh, the use of his rules, just to see how how it works out. Uh, that's that's my work these days okay. for the for Fedora server sig. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I now now that you mentioned it, I do remember Linux system roles as being uh, being basically the open source version. Well, not open source, but you know the non Red Hat. The communi community community. Uh, yeah. yeah. But this doesn't support uh, stuff that we want to support, 
like uh, NFS server and NFS client and so. And when we asked how can we add roles to this uh, package, uh, I was told, well, why don't you package Robert the Box uh, roles? And that's where we are right now. We, we really, really do not want to duplicate all the content that is on galaxy.ansible.com. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> So you, you have the Linux system uh, roles, you have uh, my package of Robert the Box uh, collections, collection. Uh, you have a free, up, uh, free IPA, which has a, a set of Ansible playbooks, and they package it as uh, an RPM in Fedora. So between all three of these uh, packages, you have already have hundreds of roles uh, installed on your system. Uh, and the question becomes, how do we keep them up to date with changes in Fedora? That, that is something that we like to um, work towards, though, as a working group, is that we would pick, um, let's say, five, just off the top of my head, five different roles, and that we'd actually have it in the Fedora server documentation as well, mm -hmm. um, so that it would be documented and then also a clear way of how to install and then run the Ansible playbook to create that role. And then we're hoping that, let's say if we just have five, that that gives users of Fedora Server enough of a background to say, oh, well, if I would just tweak this Ansible file, this playbook, this little bit, yeah. I could make it do this too. And, or I could uh, make it do this role, which is similar to this NFS role, but it's gonna do a Samba share instead, you know, something along those lines. I was just going to suggest that, like, the cockpit probably could use some improvements with the MD management or whatever, like, because if you're encrypting your MD, I don't think you can do that right now with it, uh, and, like, adding devices or replacing them if they fail and all this stuff, right? Uh, a lot of what, I, I mean, I end up just using the command line for this kind of stuff, you know, MD Atom, right? But I think there's a bunch of MD Atom functionality that probably should be in cockpit if you really wanted to use it as, like, the face panel. I assume that like people running Fedora Server tend to be more MD raidish than like using a hard. Well, out of curiosity, right? what file system are you using for your raid? Well, it tends to be XFS, yeah, on top of it all, right? I I run a butter, yeah, uh, FS array. Uh, yeah, you get RAID six for that. No, because I don't have enough disks, so it doesn't make sense. So I just do. That's what I that's what I do is I just do a raid mirror. Just because the the number of disks I'm running is four, so it doesn't make sense to do a six with four, the size disk that I have. And I don't know if they fixed it. I know for a while I think it was raid five wasn't suggested to use with butterfs, so I think there's some raid levels not suggested to use. Who's using uh, Podman in their home server? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Are you using the cockpit interface? Because there is a module you can load into cockpit. You are using it, okay. Just 
I like the you know the bifurcation. You know, not running all of my containers as root containers, for example. You know, for certain use cases, doesn't make sense. So, like, I do wish that there was a way in the Podman interface on Cockpit that I could see all of the containers that are running, like regardless of which user it is. Like, that would be super helpful. I don't know how feasible that is, but I think that that would be convenient. Like, maybe my use case is odd, you know? Because uh, the types of things I'm doing are typically, like, things that you do, like, on OpenShift clusters, where you, you know, run it under an, un, you know, like, you run it in its own namespace, like, in its own unprivileged section, you know, things. But, like, yeah, that's one of the huge benefits that I like about Podman is that you can run your containers as rootless, and as long as they don't need access to specific, you know, host-specific things, then there's no reason to run them as root, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I've been utilizing uh, utilizing Podman, at least in my own home lab stuff. Anybody else want to chime in on how they're using Fedora Server and if there's ways that we could look at improving Fedora Server in the future? From the default install to first setting something up? Yeah. Um, the default file system is still XFS. It is, yeah. Default file system is still XFS. Yeah, so I have my my main boot drive, root drive is XFS, and then I have a array of four disks that is ButterFS that I attach to as home. In my home lab. The BTRFS people from uh, Facebook uh, sometime come onto the uh, server mailing list or into our, into our weekly discussions and ask uh, what would it take for you to move to ButterFS uh, on a, by, by default and we tell them, well, we would need a very compelling reason to, to do this and we, we haven't figured out that compelling reason. I suspect the compelling reason will be, well, everybody else is doing it, so we might as well do it as well. The way this works on uh, ARM uh, boards is that we create the, the smallest partition possible and then expand it to fill uh, the sure. rest of the SD card. Yeah. So re reducing the file system is not something that we, we've ever needed to do. Right. Yeah, the default install gives you a pretty small root partition. Mm -hmm. I, I always end up, that's like the first thing I do after I set up a new server is I usually expand the XFS partition to fill the rest of the disk. Right.
like at work in particular, I found a, a situation where we were using a Fedora server and had XFS, and they made the XFS root partition way too big. And um, they had their home partition as a separate partition, and so I find, found myself in a situation where I was like, okay, I have to take this server down for maintenance because of the fact that I cannot shrink, you know, Why? the size of this root partition find a blog post in order to be able to get it to do what I needed to do, because otherwise I would have had to redeploy the server, and I was like, I don't want to do that either, you know, so, so that was kind of one of the things that I, that I disliked about XFS, like, I know it's solid as a rock, and, you know, like, it's been used for years and years and years, but it's just, like, you find those weird situations that you're troubleshooting with a customer, and they're like, why, you know, why is it like this, you know? <laughs> So another question that I have for uh, for you people is how do you get around the, the fact that you only have updates for 13 months and then you have to upgrade your Fedora server to uh, Fedora N plus one or N plus two? Mm -hmm. Like 40 comes out, okay, I'm going to stay on 39 until 41 comes out, and then I move to 40. And I basically just stay N minus 1 because, like, then I know all of the bugs and kinks are worked out, <laughs> and then I can safely move to 40. How do you update? Um, typically, I just use uh, the DNF. DNF system up, up, yeah, up, DNF great system update. update. And, uh, I, and I, you know, like, I, for home server stuff, Mm -hmm. But like, ideally, if I'm doing this in a production context, I take a you know backup. Obviously, if it's a virtual server, I take a snapshot and then you know just move forward. You know, so it really just depends on the workload and the use case. But that's where it's, I'm finding it interesting that I feel less fearful to use a newer version of Fedora um, when I have the capability of very easily rolling it back. Like, and it's built in. So like, I just go into Grub. I pick the Hmm. Okay. I think for myself, um, I guess uh, I usually take the approach of waiting a month after a new edition of Fedora comes out before I upgrade my Fedora server. And in doing that, I think uh, all my servers have been upgraded from like 38. And my desktop's been upgraded since maybe 32. And I've never had an upgrade go bad. It's just worked every single time, which absolutely amazes me that I've been able to upgrade through that many versions on my desktop, especially, and not had any issues. But my server upgrades have also gone flawlessly, and everything just comes right back up after the upgrade, after a DNF upgrade. So for me, I guess uh, I've been always impressed with the quality of our, our upgrades in the Fedora community uh, from release to release. 
the horror story that I've had is um, I had an upgrade go bad because my uh, power went out oh. while I was doing an upgrade. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's an act of God, sure, but it is a very real concern to have, you know, uh, when you're doing an update, and it can take a while sometimes, too, so that's... Yeah. And to say, that does sometimes come back. I mean, I, I, I used to sit at ROM watching the competition process uh, until the power was off or changing my mind halfway through it a few times. And, yeah. You know, it's, it's surprisingly robust. Mm. Yeah. I, I've had that happen too. I think I've had a power failure during one upgrade and it still upgraded successfully after the, it yeah. powered back on. Mm -hmm. I was just shocked to no end. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't understand how it's that resilient. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it either. I don't understand how it, it's worked that many times so well, but I usually have a hard drive failure that I have to reinstall that causes it anyway, because I'm using old hard drives. In my home lab, I just throw together whatever I can that people, other people have been throwing away, so. Well, the Buttercup, that's the part of that. I mean, you hang some things. Like, I mean, you just pull a disc, put another one in there, and then you just have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And I, so far, I haven't had to do that with the latest array that I put together, but, Which but yeah. Is part of this whole, like, disk management. I mean, like, scrubbing and, like, smart monitoring is one thing I don't have to either, right? Because, I mean, I've, I have got one job that I scrub, scrub is fun. It's sad. Yeah, and like you said, I don't know if you actually get, I don't think we get that warning right now yeah, in cockpit. Yeah, no, I mean, this is all like you check the logs and stuff. Yeah. Like on your first phone, and it's like, yeah, this is just a warning. It's like, what? Is there nothing really we can do for the log to give us a warning? I don't think so. Uh, at home, I use a DNF system upgrade, and it works. At least until, until now, it's worked flawlessly for me. At work, where I work with uh, Red Hat Enterprise, I've taken a page out of the DevOps uh, playbook, and I uh, do not upgrade my servers. I create new VMs with a new version, and uh, since we have load balancers that are pointing to the virtual machines, I tell the guys who are working the, the load balancers, just point to the new servers, and after a while, we take down the old one, and. <coughs> The, the, the good part is that migration is uh, instantaneous. need to upgrade to right, right. yeah right. Technically, we're out of time, but I don't think anybody else is using this room, so I don't know if anybody has any other things that you'd like to share with the uh, Fedora Server Working Group. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, Manuel did a good job of telling you kind of what we're most excited about right now, which I think are those Ansible playbooks. Maybe and we can tell people how to get in touch with us. Yeah, that would be good. After so, the... Yeah. So, yeah... Um, well, I'm Mo West in uh, the Matrix server group. Um, so if you want to get a hold of either one of us personally, uh, you can get into uh, the Matrix server. There, We have our own channel um, on the uh, chat Fedora project. In the, in the project's namespace, there's a server uh, channel. That's where I am all the time. Yep. And, and Peter Boy is usually there. He's kind of the leader of our group. Yeah. And... Uh, we have a weekly meeting, which is in uh, the Fedora 
uh, meeting uh, yep. channel. On uh, Wednesdays. On Wednesdays. I have no idea what the time is. Uh, it's noon Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Or no, one o'clock. One o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So, from one to two. So we have uh, weekly meetings. So we love love to have other people join the working group and uh, and help with different tasks and testing different configurations out. Um, I think there is quite a bit of interest in maybe expanding um, Fedora in the home server uh, because it's not Fedora server is not really mentioned in the press a whole lot for home server stuff. Yep. It'd be neat to kind of see that in the tech space that Fedora server gets mentioned a little more frequently in that area, give it a little more exposure. So certainly would be in favor of doing things that would assist with that. Well, yeah, reach out to us anytime. Thank you. I think it's always on. I think yeah. it's always on, yeah. You can't really hear folks that are in the audience super well from what I understand on the recording. Well, folks that want to Zora to ask me, what do you think of the end of the You do. I, it would be nice to have an LTS, wouldn't it? Because it does feel like you just get upgraded and then the, a new version of Fedora comes out and you got to upgrade your home lab again. Um, <laughs> I don't think it'll ever happen. Like Fedora, the whole point of it is that it's supposed to be kind of on the cleaning edge, fast, fast a little moving, bit yeah. fast moving. So having an LTS kernel, like one of the reasons why uh, our project, uh, which I'm part of the Universal Blue project, uh, we chose Fedora is because number one, it had RPM on stream, which is a tooling toolkit that no other you know distribution had at the time, and number two, it's because of the
standard impression. And uh, currently, the way that Docker has done things for a long time is they use gzip compression. And um, the reason why Z standard hasn't taken off is because these older versions of Docker only support gzip. And so, like, thank you, you bunch of optimists, for doing that because you package old versions of Docker and Hobie Engine in there that only support gzip. Um, but so the idea of something that's um, coming rather soon and I feel like is a, a very vital, important thing that you have to fix because otherwise if you have these really large containers that you're pulling down that are full on operating systems with packages that are inside of them, like we already run into this problem already, um, that your update size is very large and it takes a while for it to chew through everything and do everything it needs to do. So boot C and Z standard chunk is basically hopefully the holy grail and then we have another
improvements that we've, you know, like, because we've been, like, testing out Z standard chunks uh, even before its release because it's supported in Podman. It's not quite supported in Ruby Z yet. They're still working on it. But, like, yeah, we've already seen improvements for us. So, like, there, there must be something that it's doing better in um, in the container world and how it how it handles the layers and stuff like that than it does with just traditional Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it's just a really it's just a really fascinating space. Like and like it's just been weird because I, I joined Red Hat about a year ago as an Ansible technical account manager. And I was thinking I'm like, oh, day two operations, do all the things with Ansible, automate all the things, make all the things and then I and then I learned about the uh, you know Universal Blue Project RPM OS tree containers and everything else, and I'm like, okay, what's all GitHub about? I want to learn all about this. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, man, uh, this might be a revolution that's happening with uh, like we're booting containers. What what is going on here? <laughs> so yeah, it's just one of those really fascinating things that like I've ta I've tried to talk about um, this with. Other thing is on the horizon and no one has quite like got it and realized what the use cases are around it but like for me it's like you are making it so that your operators or your people that are you know deploying servers and stuff like that are doing it in the same way that their developers are so you're unifying you know the team to have a common set of tools that they both understand you know so I think I think that's something that's really fascinating as well is just devs and your operators to be speaking a similar language and they understand, you know, oh, I do it like this over here and oh, you're doing it like this over here and you're deploying containers in OpenShift and you're deploying your traditional server workloads, you know, using Blue C based containers, then it's like, oh, we better understand each other. So I think one of those and I think we have to have more discussion on this in our work working group, but yeah. One one thing that I don't want to get into either is where we end up duplicating work in Fedora because we yeah. We have CoreOS, yep. and we have Fedora Pro, mm -hmm. and then we have Fedora Server. Uh huh. And we have Fedora IoT for certain right. types of workloads. So <laughs> you got like four different server <laughs> server type yep. deployments, and for these for these different things. And uh -huh. I, I don't I don't know. I want us to be careful with Fedora Server. Typically, we're the one that's installing the apps. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and so I don't want us to to efforts and get into the same ground where maybe for where core OS is um, or where cloud is because I mean if they're already doing the work why do we have to figure it all out and get Fedora server to do it too so I, I'd rather they just go off the edge with it right I, I'd rather the that is more like, 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 like yeah. the BC makes more sense for a cloud environment because Fedora cloud is one that arguably that. but I've also been installing it on metal too mm. and it's like I like you create ISOs in order to be able to install a bootable container environment like on metal as well as in a VM as well as in the cloud like that's that's kind of the whole thing is like it's for me it's almost kind of a replacement for the way that we've been doing things for a long time not to say that it is the perfect end all be all thing because it has its drawbacks and its challenges as well that things are still being worked on but the, the way that I think started digging in and realizing like so um there's eight key difference bits and they're all the same except for like one line they yeah yeah and like that's the thing that drives me crazy is the fact that i like the idea that if you have boot c as like this base layer right as like and 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 what it is is it's basically what does a uh, a bootable operating system generally need like at a base level it needs system d it needs a kernel it needs um, other tooling and stuff like that to, to make it go, you know, it needs EOS and stuff. And, and like at a base level, those are the things that it kind of needs in order to be able to do. Like, like if you just install Fedora server with just nothing and it's just, just these base level things and it's like a completely blank slate, that's what you get. And so like for me, the thought there is, is like, okay, if, if, if boot C container, if this base level is this, then the server team can do what they want you know, because they can build on this. The IoT team can even maybe go a step below that at layer zero and build from scratch because maybe they don't need system D and these other, you know, components that mo 
most other OSD. Yeah, 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 or languages or any of the other stuff that they feel like a few students fix, which whatever, it's fine. Like we don't have to get too deep into that. But like the whole idea for me is basically like we unify Fedora as basically the main differences between the different versions of it are just the packages that you install. Like that's the reality. Like like Fedora server, the funniest part to me is about this a little bit is the fact that it's like, what's the difference if I took Fedora server and, well, I can already install a GUI, so that's cool. Like, what's the, what's the difference, like, like besides, like, the easy stuff, like, you know, I can install Fedora server and use it on a workstation. It's got a GUI. It's, I can install software the same way, like, maybe the repos are slightly different, you know, with what's available, but. Yeah, that's like, like, what's the Well, you know, yeah. Right. Smaller, right? And yeah. You know, just install cockpit on Pinball. But that's that's kind of the thing is like we have all of these different things that we're making, and it's like I feel like Boot C might be a way to unify all these things and build on a common platform so that you know, like because Workstation again is not really all that much different. It's just installing GNOME or it's installing KDE or it's installing whatever other desktop support packages that you need in order to give it to somebody who's a you know, normal person sitting at their computer. I, so. I almost do kind of wish that we had like a language that was uh, Fedora desktop and you could use maybe Fedora server. I think this is like the Anaconda failing is what yeah. I was going to talk yeah. about. That thing. Yeah. It was really, I mean, even like the Pi, you can boot it and it's got like 20 different operating systems or whatever. But the yeah. same thing should happen with Fedora. You get an yeah. image, you put it on your machine, and it comes up and the first thing is like, you want yeah, first so you use case, server, yeah. So like that's that's the thing for me, like I just I just find is very frustrating. Like you guys find it frustrating that you have these working efforts. Like from an outsider's perspective that hasn't been part of the Fedora community quite as long, like I, I see it and I'm just like, what's the difference between IoT and which and IoT and CoreOS? I, I asked this question. I'm like, what's the I, difference? Yeah, I do not know what the difference is. Do you want to know what the difference is? IoT is basically Fedora Silver Blue server is all it is, which is, yeah, that's pretty much all it is, is the difference, because it's an RPM, from what I remember, it's an RPM OS3 based system, and so is CoreOS, but Silverblue over here is doing things and composing things in a slightly different way than CoreOS does, and it's like, man, why are we not just building all from, you know, from CoreOS, you know, yeah. one place, again, man, I just keep going back to it, so much sprawl and so much different things and like I also remember in the, I think it was in the keynote, yeah, where Matthew was talking about how like disparate and spread out our infrastructure is. Like he showed the Venn diagram and then he showed all of the other circles with everything else. And I'm just like, you know, but that's just like tech debt, that is just a thing, a natural evolution of an organization, you know, and a group of how things just happen, you know, and especially in open source, like, it's different than working at a company, right? Like, at a company, I can say, thou shalt do this, and if you don't, goodbye. Not the greatest way to do it, but, like, my point is, is, like, there's a, a motivate, but, yeah, like, people like to have a job, so they're going to listen to the directive, you, can't you know? That, I, I'm you can't do that in a business. I don't know how it works, because I haven't spent any time in that community, but I'm just thinking, the, um, the Ubuntu
sure it has a reason to exist. It's just the tech debt and the duplicated effort that I see from an outsider perspective of yeah. realizing like, what's the difference between these things. When so people like, were burning out. Right. 